Cool. Well, what we want to do tonight is uh, we have the opportunity to have a, a good discussion about uh, the Supreme Court um, and its impact on uh, the churches and society and even kind of looking down the road of what the Supreme Court uh, may look like in the future. Of course, we don't know for certain what it's going to look like, but we can at least speculate a little bit about, uh, about what may happen over the course of the next eight months to eight years. Um, so our guests uh, tonight are uh, Dr. Patrick Gary. Um, he is Professor of Law at the University of South Dakota, and um, he is a constitutional historian and law professor, and, uh, and brings a, a wealth of knowledge and information to uh, discussion about the court. Um, and then uh, we have uh, Mr. Trey Dimsdale. Um, he is a law a graduate from uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City with his law degree, and, um, and also is a PhD student in ethics uh, here at Southwestern. And, um, and so uh, he has uh, quite a bit of interest in this area and kind of the crossing over of ethics and theology with, uh, with the legal field. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. And um, I'm going to start off with, you know, if we're going to talk about the Supreme Court, we're going to talk about um, the church and the intersect there. You know, a lot of this comes down to uh, matters of constitutional law. And so just kind of um, open us up with um, a little bit of information. What kind of real protections... Um, do uh, the people of faith and churches have um, from the from the Constitution and specifically from the First Amendment? Yeah, so the Constitution protects um, religious um, freedoms in the First Amendment, and, it, and there's two parts to the First Amendment. That the, the free exercise clause, which is meant to protect, you know, like individual exercise of their religious beliefs, and then the establishment clause, which prevents uh, the state from establishing a religion to the detriments of other religions or the state taking over a religion um, to the detriment of other um, religions. So there's those two different clauses uh, and um, there's, a, there's a complex relationship between the two of them. Obviously there's a lot of disputes about it, uh, about what that establishment clause means. In other words, is it a protection for a secular society? Uh, by preventing sort of any interaction between religion and the public square? Um, or is it another form of religious freedom insofar as it protects, uh, you know, each religion, each religious organization from being discriminated by the state? So that's a, depending upon your perspective, those are two different uh, interpretations. The free exercise clause then really is at the heart of the First Amendment. Um, I, unfortunately, in some ways, because of the way the court has interpreted that clause, that uh, many times it doesn't necessarily apply. We see that a lot with the, uh, uh, in the current cases that come up to the court, the, the Affordable Care Act, the Health Care Reform Act. Uh, why doesn't it protect uh, individuals there uh, in terms of, say, like the contraceptive mandate? Because the court has said that uh, that clause uh, uh, does not protect individuals when you have what's called neutral laws of general applicability. And the Affordable Care Act would be one such law because it just pertains to, here is a, is a law that is requiring employers to provide contraceptive coverage for their employees. It applies to all employers and basically all employees. So you call that neutral and general applicability. It's not singling out religion. So that somewhat guts the First Amendment uh, free exercise clause. Um, maybe I'll pass it to you, Trey. You want to kind of expand on that a bit? I think one way to think about uh, to encapsulate kind of what you described is the way the court has interpreted these things as functioning together is more of a freedom from religion created a radically secularized uh, culture in which people seem to think that they should not not be exposed to religious symbols or religious people or religious practice in the public square. Um, and that's why you end up with these cases that, that involve like a, a, a memorial that, that includes a cross that's on the side of the highway out in the middle of Arizona that no one ever sees but nonetheless you know, is, is deemed to be constitutionally impermissible because um, 
it, that, that's, that's, that's simply the, the way that these things have been conflated in a way that's, that's, that's pretty inconsistent with what the framers would have intended. Yeah, so that would be the Establishment Clause. Right. right. Yeah, and so, so in some ways, the Establishment Clause has been interpreted by the court to be very sensitive to people who, who disbelieve or who are offended by religion. But on the other hand, the Free Exercise Clause has not really been in, uh, interpreted to be really sensitive to people who might be burdened uh, by it, unless the law really singles out a religion. Obviously, if the law singles out a particular religious practice, a religious uh, uh, denomination, it's going to be unconstitutional. But if it just generally, like, say, the Affordable Care Act, uh, and that's why we've had so much litigation. Of course, the litigation there is under a statute, a federal statute, the, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is really a statute that Congress came up with after the court decided the free exercise clause the way it did. Interesting aspect there, too. That was what, Trey, in the early 90s? Something, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? That, yeah, that was during the Clinton era. Yeah, during the Clinton era. So you have a Congress who is very committed to protecting religious freedom during the Clinton era. Uh, it doesn't appear that Congress would take the same approach towards committing to protecting religious freedom now. And it's interesting. Note some of those same members of the House and the Senate are still there. Sure. Who are now decrying any state level religious freedom restoration act, and they heartily voted for it in well, I think probably around '94 or so. And uh, so it's quite an interesting uh, dynamic that's been created. Yeah, you saw that during the Indiana, right, the Indiana law and the outrage against Indiana and how Indiana was being so, like, oppressive passing this state Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Well, the federal government had passed a, a, an identical act to that back in 1993, 94, something like that. And it was overwhelmingly supported by Congress then. Well, can you all explain? For, for people who may not understand what, the, what these state level religious uh, freedom restoration acts and, and even the federal one, kind of go into the mechanics of how they work or what they're, what they're designed to protect um, and, and how, they would, uh, how they would work their, or how, how those protections would work if, if a case came up. Uh, yeah, the, the, it, it doesn't, the religious freedom restoration act is not necessarily something that um, I think that that was a part of the contract of America, and I think that the is that is that right? The New Kingdom contract of America, I believe so. It happened at that same time. Right. I don't know if they actually specified it as part of the contract. And so I think that the perception of this is that this was some sort of very proactive law that was going to um, really be a shield to government um, interfering with with religious people and churches. What it really actually does is it's a it's a, a, a statute that defines kind of jurisdictional limits of federal courts, and then when the state will, will adopt something that's similar, to, you know, it kind of defines some jurisdictional limitations of state courts, uh, where if there is a case that comes before the court, um, the uh, the court has to is not allowed to be able to determine what is and is not a sincerely held religious belief, what is and is not a legitimate doctrine of, you know, uh, you know evangelicals or, or, or Jews or whatnot. Uh, you know, one of the test cases that came up in the Tenth Circuit actually was, was one that involved a group that had just had organized uh, as a church and they, they worshipped marijuana. And um, ultimately, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals said the court has, has no ground whatsoever to determine whether or not these are legitimate uh, religious uh, practice, or these people are actually uh, hold hold these hold these convictions. That they have to presume that they hold the convictions before they apply any type of other law uh, to to the case. So uh, it, it it really is kind of defining it, it's defining the limits of judicial. Um, Discretion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what the law is really trying to do is correct then what Congress didn't like about what the Supreme Court did. If the speech speech freedoms are part of the First Amendment, if your speech freedoms are burdened by the government, the government has a very high burden to justify that. So 
the Congress in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and these states, they want to make the same true for religious exercise freedoms. Oddly enough, it was Justice Scalia, probably the, 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 the most uh, committed protector of religious liberty in a way, that wrote this decision, this Smith decision, that in a way took away um, some of our you know, constitutional freedoms regarding uh, free exercise. But he was worried really about what Trey was mentioning about is that if we allow people to, to claim exemption from any law just because they say it violates my religious belief, we could, you know, we could drift into chaos because we can't control that. The court can't be saying what's a legitimate religious belief and what isn't. And so it, it'll be chaos. That was his concern. Uh, and in reality, I think what he thought is, is that that, that uh, uh, we don't need to worry as long as laws apply across the board to everyone just because they might happen to burden certain individuals um, it, it, that's, that's like a, 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 an acceptable type of casualty it's not a targeted discrimination it's just a, sort of a, 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 an unintended casualty he didn't I think ever uh, assume that you'd have something like the Health Care Reform Act that would really end up targeting uh, religious beliefs of, of millions of Americans and, and not marginalized type of religions, but mainstream religions. Let, let's talk about that. The, the Little Sisters of the Poor case is a good example of the, um, of the Health Care Reform Act or the Affordable Care Act um, burdening religious beliefs. So uh, if you Y'all can explain to us a little bit about um, what is at stake in the uh, Little Sisters of the Poor case, why it's significant for Catholic nuns, but why it may also be significant for uh, Protestants and Evangelicals as well. Okay, you can start with that. So, so this is a good example. So the Health Care Act contains a contraceptive mandate requiring employers to provide contraceptive services and products to their employees. Uh, uh, that was a part of that was challenged in the Hobby Lobby case, and now another part of it is being challenged in the Little Sisters of the Poor case. And so, what has happened under this? And so, uh, under the Health Care Reform Act, then, is that regulations were enacted by uh, the federal government, an administrative agency, um, that required uh, that, that left an exemption for houses of worship. That means just for churches, say like a church. Um, so a church has employees, um, it, it, if they object to, have religious objections to these contraceptive requirements, then they don't have to comply with that. But then the Little Sisters of the Poor bring up religiously affiliated institutions. So the Little Sisters of the Poor aren't really operating a church, they operate homes for the elderly poor. And to do that, they have to employ people. Uh, well, they don't fit technically into this exemption that the government has granted to houses of worship. Instead, they are a religious institution. Uh, they're objecting to this. The government has crafted out an exemption, which more or less says, if you just tell us and sign a form that says you object on religious grounds to that, we'll go ahead. You don't have to pay for the... Um, Technically, you don't have to pay for the coverage. What we'll do is that, is that we will then, the government will contact your insurer, and the insurer will provide or obtain provision for contraceptive coverage. The Little Sisters of the Poor claim that, uh, hey, it, it all comes out in the end. In other words, our employees are obtaining this kind of coverage against our religious beliefs. You just want us to sort of close our eyes and you think that is going to solve our uh, objection. So that's where the case is coming about. Again, they're bringing it under this Religious Freedom Restoration Act because this Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, requires the government to prove, you know, that there is a compelling reason for this burden on the Little Sisters they're not bringing it under the First Amendment because, again, it's a neutral, generally applicable law that's, a, that's applicable to all um, employers uh, across the board. 
So you have a little system to four. I think it's a very, you know, it, it's a very attractive case if you wish to challenge this uh, requirement of the, um, of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, you have these little sisters of the poor, they, they are, they're, they're committed to helping the elderly uh, poor, um, uh, a very sympathetic type of plaintiff. I personally think the, the, the court's going to rule four to four now without Justice Scalia, and because the court will essentially tie, that means it won't come up with a decision which will essentially leave what's happened below in the cases beforehand, which will be bad for the Little Sisters of the Poor, which will say that, that they have to abide by this requirement, and then they'll just have to choose whether they are going to then compromise their religious beliefs or whether they're going to have to get out of the business of providing housing for the elderly poor. Why should we care about that trade? You know, the Catholic nuns, you know, they're one thing, but why? Who else could this impact? Southwestern Seminary. You know, it, it, if if uh, anything that's a parachurch organization that's not actually a church, and I imagine they they defer to state law in defining the church. I mean, I don't know. They, I don't know how they de define that. I mean, they, they talk about religiously affiliated institutions or houses of worship. Yeah, in, in, the, in the tax code of individual states, the individual states will sometimes have variances in the way that they define what a church is. And Texas is, is, a, is a pretty church-friendly state. Um, obviously, there's a lot of parachurch organizations that will, will incorporate here as nonprofits because of that, um, but um, it, it you know it, it ultimately you know will will end up being that uh, you know, Southwestern Seminary is is drawing because there's already Baptist colleges, Christian colleges around the country that are waiting for this to play out, um, and they're impacted by it. And Guidestone as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, as mm -hmm. as the the empty Southern Baptist life that provides insurance uh, that uh, they've, they've been drawn into this yes. case as well. What I think is really the, the, the most disturbing aspect about this Little Sisters of Poor case is that the, the congressional law does not require the con contraceptive mandate. It doesn't. A lot of people say it never would have passed Congress if that was in the law passed by Congress. It was later put, it was later adopted as government regulations by Health and Human Services, an administrative agency. So it was really the federal government that decided to go after religious institutions like this. They decided to go after that. They made a very conscious decision to, to make sure that religiously affiliated institutions had to comply with this. And of course, you, you know, so, so they really elevated sort of this contraceptive issue to the point that it, it's really uh, caused a head-on conflict uh, with religion. But it wasn't there, it was, I, I think of it, when you look at it, I think it was a decision by the administration really to, to you know, to, to tackle this sort of head-on. In other words, to sort of really, you know, continue and intensify the culture wars that sometimes we refer to. Well, you, Dr. Barry, you made the comment that you thought this case was going to end up 4-4, and, um, and so uh, that would leave um, the lower court's ruling in place. in place. So is there an option for the Little Sisters of the Poor um, to, for this case to be revisited upon um, an appointment of a ninth justice whenever that happens? Uh, or, or is it, or is the case just over with the tie and the lower court ruling stays in place? Yeah, so I think they can. Trey, you help me out on this. I think they can. In a tie, it leaves everything in place, and then you can sort of come back again. Um, and I don't know the procedure for that. We haven't had that sort of situation very often. So I think they can come back at it. But of course, most people think. I mean, if they lose now. At, at, I mean, if, they, if it's a 4-4 now, that it, a justice, say for instance, a justice, if, if say for instance, Merrick Garland would be uh, appointed, 
that's just going to make it 5-4 against the little system report, not 4-4. Not well, everything stays preserved. This was interestingly enough a moot court problem, Miles, in law school. Oh. <laughs> everything stays preserved in case it can go back to the Supreme Court. They, don't, they can't take it as a matter of right that they can file another, another petition for the court to hear it. And at that point, the court can decide to hear it or not. Yeah. But do you know if the decision, because there, there is a procedural, another procedural step uh, a possibility in the, in the federal court of appeals system where uh, normally a case that's heard on appeal, there will be three justices, a three judge panel that will hear it. But then, if, uh, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a case that's of, of significant enough import, a, a larger panel of, of, of uh, either all the judges, depending on the circuit and the, how, how large it is, all the judges that sit on that, on that court of appeals or a much larger number than three will hear it. Do you know if that's been from a larger panel? Or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So there's, there's that possibility, but it seems to me that would act, it's probably a technical discussion, it's not relevant, but, you know, just, th just thinking about how you would maneuver after a 4-4 decision, there's probably some hope, but it's very dim. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, the current situation of the board. So here we are, Justice Scalia passes away, suddenly, just, it's been a little over a month now, I guess, a few months. Um, and uh, President Obama has um, nominated a potential justice. Um, if you can kind of explain for those who may not understand, what does the process look like? What, what would the typical process look like for um, a new justice coming on the court? Um, and then uh, if that doesn't, you know, if this eight member court extends for a period of time, what's the historical precedent? But, of that, and what's the significance of you know, potentially? There's talk that this could go on for months, or a year, or longer. What's the historical significance of that? Well, so a president nominates uh, someone to be on the Supreme Court, and then it's up to the Senate to uh, to uh, approve that person. Uh, and so, usually, what happens is there's a nomination, and then uh, I, this is just according to practice. Then that, that person makes the round, as Merrick Garland is doing now, sort of meeting and talking with senators, getting to know the, the senators. And then there's hearings uh, at which the Senate then uh, 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 questions and, and sort of investigates, if you will, uh, the justice. And then there's a vote on it. Well, what's different this time along, of course, is that the Republican leadership is vowed not to hold a vote. Uh, him, and they uh, they vowed that on the basis that it's so close to the election that uh, that this is not an appropriate time to be voting on a candidate. Of course, underlying all of this is the fact that, that Justice Scalia was an incredibly strong and forceful justice. Um, so his departure will change the court. There, there's no question that it will change the court, and certainly to conservatives. Um, this is this is very important. Uh, uh, just as you can imagine, uh, 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 with liberals, with a strong sort of liberal justice leaving at this particular time, how they would react. And and there's just you've probably read about that in the newspapers. I mean, in, in previous instances, you've had Democratic senators that have said in other instances, you know, like during the um, during, during the George Bush presidency, uh, if there was a vacancy in that last year of the presidency, then that there should not be an appointment, there should not be um, hearings, and of course, now both sides are sort of reacting to that. So, um, in a way, we don't know how it will shake out because this is an this is an unusual kind of circumstance. But I think it is instructive to note that you know you really go back to Supreme Court nomination hearings all the way back to what would you say? I'd go back to Justice Borg. I, I'd go back to Justice Borg, who was nominated by um, by President Reagan, and it was a very contentious type of hearing at that time that he was denied. He was a very capable, very capable jurist. Uh, he was denied. And that really kicked off the contentiousness that we have now in, um, in, in, in Supreme Court appointments. I think it also uh, signifies 
what uh, Justice Scalia really never wanted to happen. In other words, Justice Scalia thinks that the court should not have such a prominent role in dictating sort of law to the um, to uh, the American public that the Supreme Court should occupy a more restrained role. Well, obviously, it doesn't uh, uh, play a very important role, and that's just illustrated by the fact that this this uh, nomination fight is going to be so um, you know, energetic. Yeah. And despite the fact that there were so many massive uh, culture shifting decisions that were made, kind of from the 1950s and the 1970s, that's when you had Brown versus Board of Education, the Miranda case, um, uh, all types of things that kind of uh, created new rights. That was from Roe v. Wade was in the 70s. Um, when, when Justice um, Rehnquist was nominated, actually there's kind of a, I don't know, it, it pops up every time a, a new Supreme Court justice is, is uh, nominated. Uh, there's a, a, a video of President Nixon at the, a press conference and he can't remember his name at first, and then he mispronounces it. And that's how irrelevant it was. The president wasn't really even intimately involved in the process. It was essentially a name that was handed to him of an anonymous judge or law professor or something like that, and there wasn't a, 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 a great deal of care taken. It's, it's kind of interesting that despite the fact that the, that the culture had been totally transformed in the past 20 years, it was still not an issue until midway through the, the Reagan the presidency. Another thing to keep in mind is uh, me and my eternal optimism. Uh, you know, not all is lost, even if you have like, another Ruth Bader Ginsburg appointed to the court, because you still have a, uh, a very um, Scalia-esque, at least in the judicial philosophy, Chief Justice. And despite the fact that you know the Chief Justice is first among equals, there's some very key things that Chief Justice uh, has, has has privileged to that will we, we may still see decisions handed down that are five four that we would prefer not to see come out that way. But a lot of times you will see much more uh, restrained decisions based on the way that the Chief Justice will hand out decision writing responsibilities. The Obamacare case is actually a good example of this because we, we, we tend to look at that and see it as a, as a massive loss. And what's really interesting about that is that was a 5-4 decision, uh, but uh, the, you know, the, the supposedly reliable, conservative Chief Justice Roberts was, was cited as a left-wing court um, in, in upholding uh, major portions of, of the Affordable Care Act. Um, but what, what came out of that is that in this majority opinion, because the Chief Justice was a conservative and he was the fifth vote on that, you did have some good things that came from it. You had uh, a few key components of it that were, that were struck down, um, but then you also had, for the first time since the Great Depression, a, an explicit statement in a Supreme Court majority opinion that limited the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause is a part of the Constitution that essentially, uh, since the 1930s, has given the federal government the right to do whatever they want. But Chief Justice Roberts actually said that the Commerce Clause cannot be used to regulate inaction. So that, that's a positive. And so we'll see more, well, I mean, we'll, the, if there is a, uh, a left-leaning justice appointed uh, within the next several months, those will be the types of victories that we will be seeing. They're smaller. It's not going to be shifts in culture to the, to the right, but there still will be things that will come out of the fact, that are positive that come out of the fact that we have conservative justice. So Dr. Gary, I know there's no way to know what's going to happen with the current nominee. But uh, you're here at the seminary, and so we like prophets around here. <laughs> so the prophets, the major ones and the minor ones. I'm not even a minor one. <laughs> well, we'll let you put on a minor prophet hat. How about that for a second? And um, speculate for a moment. Just what what do you think is going to happen with the nominate the nomination of uh, Judge Garland and um, and 
maybe even pushed past the election, what could happen after that? And, and even let's talk about, in, in addition to that, you know, we, Justice Scalia was not the oldest member of the court when he passed away, but there are others who are around his same age and even older. You know, what can we expect in the next few years as far as transition on the court? Well, yeah, so trying to decide, trying to predict even now what's going to happen is, is, is difficult because, uh, you know, we have these positions staked out. Uh, the Republican, uh, Republican Senate has staked out a position on this. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, Re the Republican Party has not been real successful lately in terms of in the legislative arena. Um, and I don't know if they're going to be successful in terms of delaying or, or sticking with this uh, decision not to hold the vote. Uh, obviously, they're going to be portrayed as obstructionist. It probably won't matter that, that, that they're going to say that we're doing the same thing that the Democrats said that they were going to do when they were in the same position that we're now in. That, that we're now in. Um, so there's going to come a, a lot of uh, public pressure, I think, to, to do something uh, and to act uh, on this. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier, and I said, that, you know, it, it might have been a little bit. Uh, better for the Republicans to act a, a, a little bit more subtly. You know, they're the ones, they, they control the Senate, so they control everything about this process. They could have just kind of delayed it out to the point that they couldn't get hearings completed really by the end of the year. But they staked out this position, so that's going to be the number one position. Are they going to be able to refuse to hold any kind of hearings on this candidate? Some people have said that uh, President Obama deliberately um, nominated someone who doesn't seem so extreme. Um, I think given, in a way, given the makeup of the court, I don't think it really matters. I think what he'll do is, un it's, it's without question that Merrick Garland would vote with the liberal wing of the court, and so it doesn't really matter. Is he extreme or not extreme? It's that he will sort of fall into that particular block. Um, then, you, of course, you have the election itself as it progresses. And there's even the, there's Republicans now that are talking about, a, well, do we really want to hold out? Because what have we got looking forward to November? Are we really going to have a conservative in the White House? Uh, are we going to have a Republican in the White House? If we don't have a Republican in the White House, are we going to have someone who's going to um, nominate someone even you know, more uh, leftist than Merrick Garland. Or if we do have a someone who says that he's a Republican in the White House, what kind of a person is he going to nominate uh, to the uh, court? So I, I think you have all of those uh, the, those questions. Um, uh, I would I would personally bet that uh, what will happen is that I think that the the uh, the uh, Republican Senate probably will do the do the very try its very best not to hold any hearings because I think they're uh, under this kind of Trump phenomenon. I, I think they uh, they're going to try to act kind of um, uh, unestablishment. They're going to try to um, uh, cater to a more kind of populist feel. And, uh, and, you know, but, but I, I think they're really kind of groping in terms of how to politically uh, interact. So, you know, I've talked a lot. Um, with the other prophets, you always get much more clear direction. Um, and the only thing about me that's a prophet is usually the way I dress sometimes. I'm like a prophet. Uh, but I don't know how it's going to, uh, I, I really don't know how. And, and, and the beauty of it, all of you, you can all come up with your own idea and, and nobody is going to have a better answer than you. Uh, so, Trey, give us, give us a shot of what you think might be happening. Uh, I tend to think that whoever the ninth justice ultimately will be, will be anyone but Merrick Garland. I think he's got to go in the process knowing that this that he's, he's um, a pawn, a political pawn. Um, but there, there's some things to, to, to remember uh, about, um, about the court. We, in our lifetime, we don't remember a court with less than nine justices, so we think that the, you know, having eight justices is some sort of a, of a crisis. But the Constitution actually doesn't dictate that there be nine justices. There's lots of different ways 
that Congress could construe this. So there could be a total wild card in this where you have some, you know, lunatic, uh, it's not really a lunatic idea, but just, you know, somebody who's, who's throwing a wrench into the works, who introduced the bill uh, to reduce the number of, of justices to seven. So that means that takes out of play a nomination, and it takes out of play a nomination for uh, you know, the next justice to die or resign. Um, which actually, actually, in some respects, if it could be pushed through, um, would, would buy some time. I mean, Ginsburg is a breast cancer survivor, and she's in her late 80s. And, uh, I think she's the oldest member of the court, I think so, yeah. And, I mean, people have been speculating for years that this is her last year. Even when her, her husband died a few years ago, he was sick for months and months and months. And it was it was during the Obama administration, and there was speculation surely she'll resign to be able to be with her husband in his last few months, but no, I mean that she she stayed on the court, but um, she can't she can't live forever. But um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of different options really to kind of reform the court, to depoliticize some of this, and probably make it function a little bit more um, reasonably, maybe not predictably. Um, but uh, those are, to all of that is so politicized that you know, an ideal, uh, an ideal um, solution that is never going to come to fruition because there's not any political capital that can be gained by supporting that. So outside of Justice Ginsburg, who else? You know, we, know, we know the recent justices are all quite young by comparison, but who else could we expect maybe seeing some transition in the next five to seven years? Well, then you just go down the line, right? And in terms of the age, <laughs> you just go kind They're of all down. like five or six years apart. So, yeah, who's, so, who's, so Ginsburg is obviously the oldest. Who's next? next? Justice Kennedy, okay. right, Trey? I was thinking he was the youngest of the older ones. But he's just now 80. Okay. So that puts him in the young category. <laughs> <laughs> he's only not the end of all of And where is Justice Thomas in the uh, He's in his mid-70s, I think. So I think he's got there. And, uh, and how old was Justice Scalia? He wasn't 80. He was 77, 78. Okay. And so. Realistically, we're talking about the possibility of everyone Ginsburg, yeah. Kennedy, and Thomas. In theory, let, let's assume a, whoever's elected president this term or this election cycle, if we make an assumption that they serve two terms, all three of those seats could be. And and if the if the Scalia seat is not filled, in theory, the next president could have as many as four appointments. And that's oftentimes a it's campaign issue. Right, that, that uh, it, it was a campaign issue uh, when uh, Barack Obama ran for um, uh, uh, for presidency. It's it's always now that with with the more important that the court becomes and the more power it it becomes, that that's always a campaign issue about Supreme Court appointments. So we can see some major transition. And there's there's really no optimism left if Thomas dies. Even Kennedy dies. I mean, it's not going to be too much good to have a conservative chief justice that's in a six-three minority. Yeah, it's just all right. Um, I want to ask one more question, and we'll open up the floor to questions. This is uh, a little less constitutional in nature, but but it's a little a little more churchy in nature. So, um, in the 1960s, when uh, um, President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, uh, well, I guess he wasn't, I guess he was actually still in the Senate at that point. Uh, but when the, the Johnson amendments to the tax code came okay. along as it relates to um, uh, political speech from the pulpit, can you explain a little bit to us what what all that entails and then um, and then I know we talked a little bit last night about uh, about how that has been enforced or not enforced historically for the last 50 years or so. Well, so there's tax uh, there's tax rules then that that, uh, that essentially deprive then 
we'll talk about uh, churches that, that deprive a church of its tax exempt status if they engage in uh, uh, political activity. And political activity is defined mm -hmm. as like campaigning for a particular candidate. Uh, and doing so, they always sort of talk about it like campaigning or politicking from the pulpit. Um, that's how it usually happens, right, in terms of giving uh, some type of sort of political sermon. Um, you can give, you can certainly uh, do issue advocacy um, in a house of worship or a church, but you can't uh, favor one candidate over another. Um, so this is a rule that's been going on. Um, it's always attracted a lot of controversy. Uh, because on the other hand, you know, on one hand, this is a tax rule, but it's obviously curtailing speech. It's, it's having an effect on speech, telling um, uh, pastors, for instance, what they can or cannot talk about from the pulpit. It's always uh, attracted a lot of, um, uh, of, of, a lot of uh, controversy. I think it was maybe uh, like a year and a half ago, uh, some, uh, if I remember right, something like 1,500 pastors on a particular Sunday decided to preach politics from the pulpit as a protest against it, so essentially, you know, inviting the IRS to take action against them. The IRS didn't do that, uh, you know, you have that many people doing it one time, obviously that would have been very unpopular, uh, but the IRS <laughs> seems to have a, a knack for doing things that are incredibly unpopular. Um, like taking taxes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's always a, an area of controversy. Um, and uh, 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 it's an area of controversy. There's a lot of rules uh, listed in, in, the, uh, in the tax code about it. We could go more into sort of some of the intricacies of those rules. But it, it obviously is, uh, is controversial. Pastors don't like it. They don't like to be curtailed like this. And um, we, I guess what we were talking about is, is sometimes the uneven enforcement of this. Uh, you, you know, it, it, uh, there's usually the claim that, that conservative pastors and conservative churches end up coming under more heat than more liberal uh, uh, pastors or churches come under. Um, and that just happens, and that is more along the lines of enforcement. I just offer a um, uh, sort of two thoughts to that. One, of course, is the most recent IRS scandal in which it was shown that IRS targeted conservative groups. I'm not talking about pastors, I'm not talking about this particular tax rule, but it shows that the IRS is politically conscious. <coughs> so that is troubling uh, insofar as uh, we might take a look at this tax rate. Um, but the other thing I think, too, is that um, and this is a kind of a sweeping generalization that I put, but I think within the respect that sometimes you get uneven type of enforcement of this regulation is that I think oftentimes conservative groups, uh, again, I'm being very generalized and stereotypical, uh, look on religion in a slightly more um, uh, uh, sanctified way perhaps than maybe liberal groups might look on it. And so therefore, they're more hesitant to call out and to sort of say, we ought to go after pastors preaching. Um, I, I think that they might have more of a respect for what's happening at the pulpit, what's happening in the church. Whereas maybe liberal groups, perhaps, um, that might not have that same sort of attitude towards religion, might be more prone to sort of push the IRS to investigate, you know, uh, instances of political activity in conservative churches. And one thing to remember is that the, 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 this, the tax regulation actually has very little teeth. The real success of it is it has embedded into our minds that there are some things that are just inappropriate for a church to address. Um, so it's, it's actually kind of subtly influenced our thinking about um, uh, you know, that rather than actually offering some real consequence. I mean, it's not, there's no pastor that's going to be thrown off to jail. Uh, and, and the only thing he's really, you're really putting at risk is you lose your tax exempt status, and there's nothing that says that tomorrow you can't file to get it back. Uh, you know, 
So, I mean, all of that's a massive hassle. Um, and I guess if they started trying, if they started doing that type of stuff, yeah, it would, it would really, really cause a lot of, um, of um, trouble for church, for churches. They could certainly go in and make their lives miserable. Um, and I'm not saying it's even a, a good regulation, but there's not nearly as much at risk uh, as a lot of people seem to think that there is if they are engaging in something that crosses the line. Not that it's ethical to counsel a church to cross the line. All right. Well, uh, well I want to spend some time uh, taking some questions from the floor, so we'll... Uh, We'll entertain questions. So if you would uh, raise your hand, one of the gentlemen with the microphones will come around, and um, if you'll uh, stand up, state your name, and, uh, and what degree program you were in, and then uh, succinctly ask your questions so that uh, we can get as many questions as possible. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey Horn and Diff. Um, so since you say that the uh, um, that tax regulation doesn't have any teeth. So if I were to say, don't vote for Trey Dimsdale, Trey Dimsdale is an unbiblical candidate, how much teeth does that regulation have, exactly? Like how does that, uh, how would it unfold if somebody wanted to? Yeah, how would it unfold and how much power does the IRS or whatever government organizations, organs or, you know, how it unfold, how much power does the state, the government, various organizations, what can happen to me, my church, the convention, whatever? No, nothing can happen to the convention. Uh, you won't go to jail. Um, there, at the very worst, the IRS could begin an investigation into into your behavior and whether it, and you know, determine whether or not it, it falls outside of the range of acceptable um, behavior and then if they determine it does the church loses its tax exempt status. So when people give to the church it's no longer tax exempt and the church then would probably have to start kind of paying property tax. That's expensive. I mean, those those are those are significant things. Um, but um, you know, it's it's we, we tend to have a have a conception that we're going to end up with pastors being pulled out of the pulpit by the Gestapo and thrown in jail. Um, but that's I mean, I mean by by kind of dispelling that myth, it doesn't mean that this is a good regulation. It just means that if you feel convicted to address a certain issue in the pulpit. Uh, you should know what's at stake when you decide to do it. And so that, that's really what's at stake. And you can address the issue, you just can't lobby in favor of a candidate. You can't address issues, you can do voter education, you just can't, you know, advocate on behalf of a candidate. Actually, I think it'd be best, I think it'd be better if the pastor were hauled off to jail in a way it would, uh, it would, uh, certainly cause, in some ways, bring an issue to your head and I think cause a lot of public sympathy. The problem with losing your tax exempt status is the IRS moves in. And once that happens, you know, who knows and, and uh, who knows how long you can, it'll be before you get it back. And for many churches that could be devastating. That could be the difference between making it or, or, or breaking it. Other questions? Uh, my name is Gene Garcia, I'm in the MDF program. Uh, historically, or at least the last three or four decades, the court has tended to side when it views uh, free speech regarding groups and, for instance, whether or not something is malicious in intention, right? such as KKK wanting to march through predominantly black neighborhoods in Chicago and voting that would be malicious in intent and therefore not allowing that under the free speech guise. For pastors in the pulpit, where does that freedom of speech along with freedom of religion fall on with, for instance, same-sex marriage? Um, where is the line demarcated with when their speech becomes malicious uh, when they're preaching what scripture teaches regarding that subject? 
Where does the um, pastor, when does the pastor's speech become malicious? Uh, well, I mean, speaking, there should be nothing preventing a pastor from speaking about the issue of same-sex marriage from the, from the pulpit. You know, nothing. And there should be no way that the government could come in and punish the pastor for that kind of speech. That's an issue, and that relates to, not only is it an issue which you can speak about, but it relates to a religious belief. So there should be nothing there that, um, that the government can do. That's not to say, of course, that there isn't a lot of other social pressure that could come to bear that, we, you know, that we've seen in terms of uh, different types of protests uh, of it. But I can't uh, envision a case in which that past could be punished. Could you, Drake? No, I mean, just, there have been little isolated cases of, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the situation down in Houston a couple of years ago, the city was requiring, I uh, wanted to try to require pastors to submit their sermons to the mayor's office for approval. I mean, that was met with so much outrage from both sides of, of, the, of the issue. It's, it's hard to imagine. I mean, the only, the only theoretical situation that I could see is that the court has, has historically refused to protect speech that incites violence. Is that what you're making reference to? Not necessarily that, so much as with the concept of possible 6 3 liberal court, could they, because they have a majority, oh, could they, could they ultimately get to that point? Uh, anything can happen. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, 15 years ago, I think if we had this grindstone, you probably have people saying it's inconceivable that the court would allow homosexual marriage. But, um, you know, I, I think the only, only foreseeable, in my mind, the only type of foreseeable circumstance you can really have uh, with a pastor being penalized for what in the pulpit is if it's something that is intended to incite violence. Because that's not protected. But how, how would you think that that would weigh? Uh, I don't know how that could be. I just don't see, I don't see it, uh, how you could have any kind of legal sanctions against a pastor in that sense by the government. But like Trey said, you know, I don't foresee even a liberal court uh, uh, upholding that. But maybe things will change too. Hi, uh, Andrew Morris, uh, MDiv. I'm also an attorney. Um, so nice to meet you. And uh, I wanted to refer back to some a comment you made about the Merrick Garland situation in the Supreme Court. You said, uh, in terms of, you know, people make, say that maybe Obama nominated him because he's less liberal than others to put the Republicans in a dilemma. Well, that tactical move has been very interesting to me. I mean, you said it doesn't really matter because you think Garland will just go with the liberal majority no matter what. Uh, that I'm curious to see what the basis is for you saying that because, for example, Ronald Reagan appointed Kennedy, I think he appointed it as a sewer of Breyer, uh, one of those guys who's on the liberal wing. Um, sometimes justices don't pan out the way we expect them to, and especially if it's a, what seems to be a more moderate justice in Garland. Isn't there some kind of a dilemma that does put the Republicans in? Because I personally believe we're there's a very high chance we're talking about a, a Clinton or her vice president end up being president uh, if she gets indicted. Um, that means liberal way more liberal justice. If, I mean, if Trump was the nomination, we're probably going to lose the Senate as well. So you're talking about railroading the liberal justice right through in the Supreme Court. Should the Republicans think about Garland now? Yeah, so you, you pretty you really laid out the dilemma, you know, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, what should Republicans do or just from a Republican-oriented strategy. You really laid that out, I, I think. Um, you know, uh, not much I can, uh, I can uh, respond to there. That's a good, I think, portrayal of, the, of some of the dilemmas that are faced by the political actors in this case. 
What I will respond to is that you're right. The um, justices don't always turn out the way you think they're going to be. But here's the theory I'm going to give you. They usually don't turn, they usually go from conservative to liberal, not the other way around. So I don't know of a justice that has been nominated by a Democratic president that's turned out to be conservative other than Justice White who was nominated by President Kennedy. And Justice White, I think you would say that he ended up to be a moderate. But he was nominated by a Democratic candidate. Now here I'm going to um, use Trey as, as a resource and list all of the Republican-nominated uh, justices who have <laughs> drifted then to the left. The first person I'm going to count was Justice Souter, of course. Uh, became one of the most liberal members of the court, uh, nominated by uh, by uh, President Bush. Justice Stevens, nominated by President Nixon, became one of the, the leader of the liberal wing. Um, Justice Blackmun, Justice, well, Justice Warren, Chief Justice yeah. Warren. Um, Justice Kennedy, of course, was nominated by um, by uh, President Reagan. I think you you call him a He's a, he's a libertarian, but I think he, he ends up kind of falling in that middle. Justice O'Connor uh, was a moderate. So there seems to be, and there's a lot of reasons to speculate why, the justices, once they're nominated, if they're going to drift, they seem to drift to the left, not to the right. And there's also um, a, uh, a vein of thought that would say, you, if, you're, if you're going to you're going to have to have to have someone on the court that's ideologically opposed. You want someone who's ideologically consistent. So it would, in, in theory, be better for the inner workings of the court, for the predictability of the law, to have another Ginsburg than to have somebody in the middle. Because at least that person has a well-developed and consistent judicial philosophy. I, I don't know that much about Garland to say whether or not he has a, has a consistent judicial philosophy, but this is part of the problem with O'Connor. And so O'Connor was a true swing vote because she really wasn't prepared to go on court. You know, she'd been an attorney in private practice, and then she had served for a few years on the like Arizona Court of Appeals. This is not the typical resume of a Supreme Court justice. You really want somebody who spent their entire career thinking about the types of things that the Supreme Court decides. We, we tend to only think about the big issues that come up. Well, they, they decide a lot of things fairly boring. You know, they've been very laborious, and, and they have, you know, it's not, and not every case is a 5-4 split in the way that you kind of consistently, a lot, a lot of the issues they decide are procedural, a lot of the cases that they decide are, uh, are very technical, so you'll end up with, with strange combinations of justices and agreement simply on the interpretation of the federal rules of civil procedure. But you don't want somebody who's going to go into their their, their, um, what do they call it? Their conferences. Their, when they're deciding on, on how to vote, when they're going around taking a vote, that is easily swayed. You know, by joking. So you would want a Scalia and you would want a Ginsburg type um, person, a strong personality and strong opinions rather than somebody who's wishing watching. Because then it's just, it's completely unpredictable. And when you look at O'Connor's landmark decisions that she wrote, like the case to be Planned Parenthood, it's a, it's a giant mess. You, know, you, you really want somebody who's very well qualified, just ir irrespective of whether they agree with you or not. In fact, in recent history, we've even had a couple of non-zero decisions against the, uh, the Obama administration, mm -hmm. which would kind of be surprising, you would think that that the left wing of the court would almost always side with the, the administration in power right now, but you know when when the whole when the whole court deems you know whatever you're doing is unconstitutional. You're like the Rosada Tabor case, a, a, yeah. A, 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 yeah, a religious exercise case, a 9-0 against the Obama administration. That, that 9-0 decisions are rare, and then to go against the Obama administration. Another question.
Western Dingleborn, the S program. Um, my question is, as the baby boom generation starts to decrease in the political realm, and the next couple of generations start to rise in more political power, where do you see that taking effect in the uh, judicial system as a whole right now? So as, um, kind of as we have this generational shift and the, uh, and the baby boomers sort of drop out and the newer generations sort of come up and, and what, how is that going to influence us in the um, uh, judicial arena? Um, you know, the, um, the answer I'll give you is the answer that I give based upon how I see law students. So law students are clearly a, a really a young generation, but um, over time it seems as if uh, uh, younger generations are becoming more libertarian, uh, and by libertarian, what I mean is uh, uh, libertarian uh, focuses on, on the freedom of the individual. And that's really part conservative, part, um, part liberal. They don't go along with sort of big government and, and, and state rule as, as the left would. But they also then don't believe in, in kind of cultural conservatism in, in terms of cultural values or things that would moderate uh, individual uh, behavior. Uh, so they tend to be just libertarian in terms of just individualistic, individual freedom. They don't really tend to trust institutions. Um, and you see that, I think, in, in terms of with, with each next generation, that there's less and less trust of institutions. Less and less trust of government as an institution, but also of, of really any institution, including religion, uh, any sort of social institution out there. So that's one theme I would give you that maybe is going to influence uh, the, uh, the, the judicial arena is that if this, if this kind of um, libertarianism sort of uh, continues uh, sort of up the line. But keep in mind, too, that young people tend to be libertarian. And that the older they get, then they lose that libertarian sort of streak. So, um, so you know, I don't know how accurate that is. Um, uh, but other than that, I guess that's maybe the, like one prediction I might make in terms of a judicial arena. It certainly appears as if the court's going to continue to grow in importance. That we're going to leave questions to the courts to, to decide. Um, uh, questions that maybe the political arena ought to decide. Um, that was certainly Justice Scalia's uh, emphasis that the political arena should be deciding questions. Uh, the same-sex marriage case, the Obergefell case, was very much in line with that. He didn't think that the Supreme Court should be coming up with a constitutional right to same-sex marriage and then essentially imposing it on the country as a whole, that that's something that was, reflects values and that a, a, uh, a democratic society ought to decide for themselves. Right. I, I think, um, I think part, in part the legal profession as a whole, uh, and, and you've got judges that are a small segment of that, is insulated from the, to a large degree, uh, from the kind of the differences in generational values because of the nature of the profession. Um, obviously you'll have you have younger attorneys who are the ones that kind of conceived of, of suing the tobacco industry um, or the gun manufacturers you know, a few years ago, 10 or 15 years ago. But the ethics of the profession requires that, the, that, that your attorney seek your best interest. They're not seeking the best interest of the system. So you may have an attorney that's going to court and arguing a legal theory that the court will ultimately adopt that doesn't take a long view, that's not something that's going to ultimately be beneficial for the way the law is interpreted, generally speaking. The court's only considering your case and your controversy. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat of an idealist uh, in that you know, lawyers kind of get a bad rap for 
um, being uh, unscrupulous or not having any, any type of you know, ethical compass. Um, they can use car sales. Right, right. Uh, but, you know, realistically, though, you know, attorneys are, uh, you know, if you take all the attorneys out of society, you would, you would be shocked to see how quickly things grind to a halt. In many ways, they're the, they're the, the grease that keeps commerce moving. Um, and so, um, And, and, and I'm idealistic about you know judges taking their position seriously. I think that you know, regardless of whether they stand ideologically, I think they try to be apolitical. But um, but the fact remains that when you when you when you're on the level of someone advocating in the Supreme Court, making brief, you know, writing a brief, advocating a position. Um, that is influential to, to the justices. I mean, there was some there was a study done while I was in law school, actually, on the, um, the, the outcome of cases uh, when a court would hear oral arguments versus deciding it only on a brief, because most appellate courts in most states on most levels can decide, yes, we'll have the attorneys come in, make their arguments so that they can ask questions, or they'll just simply write a brief in a 30-page paper, basically, advocating for a position. And, um, by and large, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of cross jurisdictions was that the oral advocacy mattered dramatically. It's huge numbers, like seventy percent or something like that, and that you know reversal rates if there were actually an oral argument. So, if the attorney is a, is advancing an argument that's not oriented toward the health of the system. That is really not going to uh, going to matter much what that attorney's values are or their view of the system, because there's a limited a limited uh, set of options that an attorney has uh, and is ethically bound to. So that's that's my view. Uh, no questions. Todd Smith, I'm in the VA program. Um, my question relates to back to the church and pastors being able to talk for political speech. I know the way the tax codes are, we can't give too much political speech for the pulpit like you talked about. But how does that relate to like uh, away from the pulpit, like a pastor just give an example of Robert Jeffers who went out and endorsed Donald Trump? How can that tax code come back on him there in the church or camp? Uh, well, it shouldn't. Yeah. So uh, a pastor is an individual, an individual citizen. Pastors can go out and say anything they want to. They just can't say it in, a, in, in connection with the institution. So you can't like say it from the pulpit. But hey, you could walk out of the church, and um, uh, if, uh, if if some newspaper reporter wants to interview you, you can talk. Uh, you can campaign for you. Go. You walk from the church to a to a candidate's uh, headquarters. And campaigns, so you have every right to do that. You just can't do it like as agent of the tax exempt institution. Okay, this is my second question for the day. Um, and I'm going to try to state this without sounding uh, too political, but would you think it's the government's responsibility to impose, uh, let's see, biblical divine law that God gives us in the Bible um, on, for example, uh, in America, uh, I guess I need to give you a little pretext. So Aquinas believed there's a natural law and divine law. And Aquinas would say it's not the government's job to enforce the divine law, which is biblical. Um, now, a lot of things from the natural law are in line with divine law, for example, do not murder, uh, do not steal, etc. Um, but a lot of things I think we see uh, have nothing really to do with divine law, but Christians think that that should be imposed by government as well. So, 
I don't really know where to stand on this, but since you, you know, know a lot to do with the law, I'm just wondering what your thoughts on it would be. Is that clear? Is the question pretty clear? Well, it's a pretty broad question, so yeah. let me tackle it, and then you tell me if I don't quite get it, okay? Yeah. Um, sure, I, I think many of us believe that uh, legal, the legal system in the, the United States is based upon natural law. Uh, the Constitution is based upon natural law. The Bill of Rights is based upon natural law. That is like natural law becomes the source for our laws. Um, and we get natural law, and, and, and natural law can come from divine law or our perception of divine law. Um, I, there is nothing, in my view, that prevents um, a, a democracy from considering divine law. Uh, because in a democracy, you can consider any value you want to in terms of deciding how you're going to vote. It, it, if I think that it's God's law that we protect the environment, and I, I uh, uh, vote for in, environmentally strict laws, uh, I, I, it shouldn't matter whether I'm doing it based upon some kind of environmental science or my impression of God's law. So that's something we can't ever, I think, change. We can't dictate what people believe and then how they act on their beliefs. I think, though, you're asking, like, should somehow we take a set of prescribed divine law and then, then automatically sort of encode them in our civil law? Is that it? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, so that would be then a, a problem that, that is posed by the Establishment Clause, in, insofar as the Establishment Clause says that the government cannot establish a religion. Well, one way to establish a religion would be taking sort of the beliefs of a religion and then putting them into law um, because they are the beliefs of a religion and therefore you are in essentially elevating that religion. Although I, I actually think that oftentimes the religion that is hurt most in an establishment scenario is the religion that gets established. Because if we've seen throughout history and across the world, established religions don't do well. Um, throughout Europe, you know, established religions are failing or have failed uh, because they just haven't built up the, the following. Um, so I, I, if you're asking my opinion, I wouldn't favor that. And I wouldn't favor that from an establishment clause um, arena. That's not to say that the establishment clause prevents or should prevent religion from entering into the whole debate. Now, I don't think that's true at all. I think the Establishment Clause doesn't prevent that. So, we're a democracy, and we're a democracy that, that was unquestionably influenced and shaped by religious factors. And you go back to the, the, the history of America, and that's not a difficult proposition to prove up. And, and we are a people of, of a lot of beliefs. Religion is, is very important. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's something that we uh, consider when making laws and conducting our life. The Establishment Clause shouldn't have anything to do with that, shouldn't prohibit that at all. But if you're just asking, like, should somehow we take some kind of religious rules and then automatically transcribe those into law. I mean, I think that's that's a problem. Um, that's a problem by the religion, by the establishment clause. But it's also a problem when you think of, you know, it's not a long-lasting solution. Even if you're kind of the lucky religion that that all of a sudden gets all of their beliefs encased in law, the problem is it's because it never ends there. You know then as the religious nature of American society changed, the next religion that gains power is going to put their own beliefs into law. And suddenly you're going to find your religious liberty diminished. Uh, I'll let Trey kind of pick up on that. Because that's a pretty, you, you, you bring up a lot of topics there. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it just, I think it's important because a lot of, I think, Christians, um, because we have lived in a sort of Christian nation for so long, when a, a lot of our Christian values are kind of going out the window and government's okay with it and, and we're like, well, the Bible says this, but does, does the government, is that its job to reinforce what the Bible says? 
No, it's, I mean, it's, the, the, the job of a government is democracy is to do what the majority of the people tell it to do. And the majority of people form their own value judgments. No, unquestionably, they're going to be shaped by religion, which is okay. I mean, that's, that's the nature of it. I mean, just like I can, if, just like if I belong to a, uh, it, my whole life is in um, collecting old cars. That's all the, the only thing I care about. So every time I vote for a law, the only thing I care about is what impact is going to have on the preservation of old cars. It, in a democracy, that's fine. I can decide any way I want to. Um, uh, uh, but but, uh, but it, it's different than I think in, in what you're really talking about is sort of taking religious precepts and sort of automatically putting them into law. Uh, I think that aspect it is not only unconstitutional by a establishment clause, uh, uh, but it's, it's also inviting, I think it's just very problematic for religion itself. It's very problematic because then you're putting yourself into that established religion mode and no established religion that I know of in history has prospered over the long run. Are you talking about like in a, in a theoretical state if you're just building something from the ground up? And not necessarily no. in America? No, not, not theoretical, no. Okay. Um, it's, I think that it's a, and are you, are you, are you getting at the idea of a Christian America type idea of? Yeah, more or less. I mean, this is an extreme example, but for example, gay marriage um, is a hot topic. And is that against the natural law? I don't know, maybe, probably. Um, but the big, the, the biggest thing with gay marriage is, well, God says that this marriage is for one man and one woman, and so everybody, I mean, I think, yeah, we all got pretty upset because it went against the Bible, but, like I was saying, well, that is that the government's job to just, oh, well, this is what the Bible says, so, you know, I guess we're going to have to enforce this. Well, it, okay, in, in individual situations like that where you've got some one particular type of social issue, um, I mean, uh, kind of the answer to your rhetorical question is yes, that violates the natural law. You know, this, this homosexual marriage, homosexual relationships, or else it wouldn't be immoral. Um, but there are our religious reasons why the government has no business sanctioning it. And um, that, that anyone can rationally buy into, regardless of, of, their, of their religious persuasion. Now, we're obviously talking about the Christian faith and not other faiths. And it's, it's, it's impossible to have, you know, the Christian faith does not lend itself to what you're describing. And that's why it's always been such an unworkable um, proposition. Um, you know, because the Christian faith is not a man-made religion. It wasn't designed kind of from the beginning to be something that was going to, you know, even though you do have Old Testament civil law that govern the state of Israel, God's chosen people living in community, it didn't have anything to do with their, their religion per se. Um, you know, Christianity was not designed to, it, it, Christianity was brought into a pre-existing state. And part of the genius of the Christian faith that's supernatural and not man-made is that there's wide latitude for the types of cultures that it fits into. You know, and for Christianity to survive and thrive, there has to be a uniquely cultural expression of it. And I'm not talking in terms of like these cultural theologies, like you know, um, liberation theologies and things like that. But uh, like a, there has to be a uniquely Chinese church for the church to survive and grow and thrive in China. There has to be a uniquely Korean expression of the church. For, the, for Christianity to survive and thrive in Korea. Because that's the church is the vehicle through which God has ordained the faith to, 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 to pass from generation to generation, not the state. And the state and the church are related, conceptually related, as having authority, legitimate authority over men, but they're not the same thing. In Islam, 
Islam is a man-made religion. And I guess this is getting recorded, so I don't, I don't know. I won't, I won't check my mail for the next few days. Um, but Islam is a man-made religion, and it, and it was front-loaded with all of these precepts that control every aspect of life. So, uh, you know, even in, even when you read, um, you know, there are these people that have kind of, that, that that adopt this theonomy view and they try to structure the Christian faith in a way that you could have a Christian state. Um, you know, there's uh, Rush Dooney. Um, he's the only one that kind of comes to mind as a theorist that kind of tries to do this. But when you read. Uh, like Miroslav Volk has a book called A Public Faith. And in, in A Public Faith, he's talking about like this, like a, 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 an immersive state that's completely you know, dictated by the tenets of religion. And he even says in this, there's not a coherent Christian expression in this. So we're not going to consider that. I'm going to talk about the, you know, he, he uses this as, as, as an example, extreme Islam. Um, from this, this Egyptian theorist named Qutub, K -K -R -Q -T -U -B, um, and his vision for the way that the Islamic state should exist. So it's, it's, it's not something that's even possible when we're talking about, about the Christian faith, because uh, in some ways, and, and the people who are kind of you know, interested in like reclaiming America for Christ and making America great again and you know, that type of stuff um, are actually denigrating the value of Christianity because Christianity is so um, unchangeable but at the same time adaptable to different times and circumstances. Yeah, I think you were, what, what maybe you're getting at is, is like doing an experiment where all of a sudden um, Christians feel under siege, and so they want to pass Christian laws to make sure that they, they kind of, that society retains a Christian identity, kind of. Um, but in reality, when you look at it the way it's gone, is that almost all of our laws have come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. All of our, that was really sort of the beginning of law, in a way, the modern law. And it's just that most people agree with those laws, you know. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Those laws work really well. But the, consider the example of Sunday closing laws. You know, those laws were really motivated, uh, came from religious sensibilities. Um, and as society changed, those laws, I mean, changed. I think, you know, same-sex marriage is like one of those kinds of laws that, that yes, it sort of naturally flowed out of a... Uh, out of a Christian tradition, and then um, society's changed, you know, and and so now we're kind of bad, but it's it's flipped, you know. The debate isn't that we should mandate um, male female; it's the question of do we mandate same sex religion. So the question's flipped. Any other questions? Got time for maybe one more. Unless it's a yes no question, then <laughs> so you can keep your answer uh, pretty short. It's, it's a current event question. Uh, in the news lately, a number of attorneys general are now being accused of using their uh, attorney general powers to politically harass uh, the oil giant Exxon and other such anti global or global warming criminals, and uh, they're trying to subpoena them for all kinds of information and stuff under a fraud statute without actually having any evidence that they've committed fraud. So I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on this latest abuse of government power in light of, you know, Obama going around Congress, IRS targeting people. I mean, this it's not a new phenomenon of government doing this, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on the latest developments. Yeah, well, that that's attracted a lot of news lately about uh, climate change and the reaction, the, the, the 
the government's sort of reaction against this and a new wave of strategy, in other words, affirmatively going against people who deny climate change. Um, uh, well, it, it, on one hand, of course, there are those that see this as political persecution and infringement on free speech. Uh, uh, on the other side, uh, they see uh, companies like uh, Exxon as like a tobacco company who sees, in fact, that they know the truth of climate change and they are contributing to climate change and they are deceiving the public in order to sell their products. So th those are um, sort of, I think, the two sides uh, of the issue. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you could all make your own decisions, I think, uh, about the, the appropriateness of this, or the wisdom. I think that's the two um, sides of it. Um, and, and it is becoming a very politicized issue. I think, if anything, we're also seeing that, you know, I, I teach uh, in law schools. Law schools have become very politicized. The um, uh, liberal arts has become very politicized. I think now we're seeing science becoming very politicized. It used to be that science maybe wasn't so politicized. Now obviously we're in that whole debate on, on, on uh, climate change, science has become very politicized and to the point that I think people on either side of the issue don't trust the science. You know, they don't trust the, the, uh, the, the science that's presented by the other side. Uh, it, you know, it, that's not really um, something I, I have, I, I guess, passionate opinions about. I guess I, I actually do have real, real opinions about. Um, uh, I tend to think that the vehicle for them to be able to do this I mean, it is is a more uh, more fundamental issue. I'm not really sure that. Um, if, if, the, if the abuse is happening, it, it, it really is, I think, usually indicative that the vehicle shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, be it harassing private companies and, and, and you know, that way. Um, but I tend to think there's very, very few legitimate functions of government. So, you know. I have a hard time believing that Exxon knows more about climate change than do scientists. You know, I don't think that's what Exxon. Now, tobacco companies, indeed, knew about the effects of tobacco, but that was a more contained kind. Of, I mean, that was their product, and after all, they knew that it was addictive because that that sold the product for them. It's hard for me to believe that Exxon knows has special knowledge of climate change uh, that it's not sharing with them which would be the basis of the government investigation <coughs> against it. But, but you know, I mean, if, if there's, you just see this, I think, a lot now with, with um, things that people disagree with. We certainly see this all across the country in the area of, well, bathrooms, <laughs> bathrooms, uh, you know, um, that uh, people who hold a different viewpoint end up becoming the objects of all kinds of of harsh actions. All right. Well, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Gary and Mr. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our uh, final grindstone for the semester, um, since we have, you know, all of about four days worth of class left. Um, so, uh, uh, wish you well as you're finishing up your assignments for the semester.